Welcome to the Course One podcast. In this podcast, we explore the emerging open financial system. We dive into scalability, interoperability, proof of stake, blockchains, and many other parts of this coming financial singularity. Tune in every Monday to dive deep into these cutting edge projects and protocols with Course One team members and guests. Hi, and welcome to the Course One podcast. I'm here today with Eric Wall. Uh, Eric Wall is like one of my favorite people on Twitter because I, I've been, you know, I've been interested and deeply involved in kind of Bitcoin space for a very long time. And it feels like many bit or many people who are very vocal about Bitcoin and not just Bitcoin, but, you know, many projects in the crypto space tend to get like very ideological and it almost becomes a religion and it it, it all starts to be very much like, you know, everything about this is good, everything else is bad. So what I really uh, enjoy about Eric is that, you know, he strikes me as very open-minded and like looking at many different things and including being able to question, you know, things about Bitcoin and about other things. So I really enjoy that about about your tweets and, and your kind of like media posts. So thanks so much for that. Wow, yeah, thanks uh, thanks so much. Uh, that makes me very happy to hear. And um, it's like my, my general strategy with Twitter is basically that I feel that just in the same way that, so cryptocurrencies have a value, but this price sort of fluctuates around that value, value very volatilely. In the same way, I think that there is a truth to the cryptocurrency space, but that the public narrative tends to overshoot and undershoot all the time. So whenever we're discussing a topic or a phenomenon, the way that I tend to approach the subject is that if I feel that there's too much push on one side, then I'll start to take the other side of that argument. So I'm always sort of in the contrarian position. And I guess that that's probably the reason why uh, some people get the feeling that I'm very open-minded because I'm always taking the, the the side of the argument that I don't think is getting enough uh, uh, support. Okay, that's also an interesting strategy. But yeah, I think it's definitely, I would say, definitely adds diversity and richness to the debate. So uh, tell us a little bit, how did you get involved in the crypto space and what has your journey been through it? First of all, I just want to say, you know, thank, thank you so much for inviting me on, on this uh, podcast. And I've been a longtime fan of your show, the Epicenter show, where you and the, and the, the thing that I like specifically about that show is that you actually go into some of the underlying game theory and philosophy and design choices of the protocols with the uh, guests on your episodes. And uh, when I'm watching those episodes, I often feel like I'm learning sometimes more from you guys about the protocols that you are that you're interviewing uh, than from the guests themselves so and i think you're one of the few podcasts in the space that that does that so re- really really happy to be here cool thanks so much that's awesome yeah so anyway my my background is i spent most of my career in the traditional financial exchange business so we built uh, a, I, w- I was working for a swedish fintech company called sinober we built matching engine technology and clearing uh, technology for the traditional financial space. So it was uh, the the company was founded in 1998. One of the first co- uh, customers of the company was the American Stock Exchange, and for a long time, uh, my company, Sinober, Nasdaq were the largest. Sinober was the largest competitor to Nasdaq in the being a technology vendor for the sort of tier one uh, exchanges and clearinghouses uh, around the world. And it, and it was sort of in 2008 where after the financial crisis where Sinober found the need for real-time clearing systems. Uh, that means that clearing systems uh, for clearing houses that work in real time, they developed those in 2008 and became sort of the market leader in that um, segment for many, many years. Uh, I joined the company in 2015 as a, um, because I had, a, I, I was at, at, the, at that time, at that point in time, I was a computer science student. I had specialized in blockchain technology. I was a Bitcoin enthusiast. I was a cryptocurrency trader. So I joined the company originally as someone who was in charge of the blockchain uh, strategy for the company. And, and originally it meant develop, developing uh, enterprise blockchain solutions for the traditional financial world. So the, the depository that tracks where secu- who is the owner of securities, that was the layer that I was uh, working with. 
uh, transforming and it was based off of my uh, master thesis at the university that was specifically written on that domain for that same uh, company so I, I i worked for with that for a couple of years and but um, i would say that uh, for every everyone that has been working for a, a mid-sized tra- traditional financial company in the enterprise world during the blockchain hype of 2016 2017 it was a very strange time and most of the time most of my work actually went into convincing our clients that we our company had a decent and 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 useful blockchain strategy so most of it was just putting presentations together about blockchains explaining the technology to our clients just to make they make them feel safe that we know uh, what what we're doing and sort of in the, uh, towards the 2017 I changed the I, I became the uh, the head of blockchain for the uh, that company and I uh, changed the course as I was getting more and more um, tired with the promises of enterprise blockchains and the failure to deliver anything that had even a shred of decentralization left in those platforms when they were reaching production uh, stage uh, and then we so I pivoted the company strategy to start building a cryptocurrency exchanges uh, instead and we delivered technology to uh, Bitfinex and we delivered technology to Bitstamp and uh, at the shift of the year uh, this year uh, so about one year ago uh, Nasdaq purchased our company uh, which allowed me to finally you know break free from the enterprise world and and do something out of my own so that's that's what I'm doing now the the fund that I'm launching is called Arcane Assets and it's a cryptocurrency fund that I'll be uh, the fund manager of. Cool, congratulations. That's a that's a great uh, a great accomplishment to to run your own fund. I'm sure there will be lots of fun and an interesting intellectual challenge. Right. Well, let's let's get into a little bit of the topic that you know, especially we wanted to talk you about today so or or actually maybe maybe let's take a step back first so it seems like a lot of your focus is on bitcoin what do you find particularly appealing about bitcoin as opposed to you know kind of like other crypto assets yeah that's a good a good question so i think the primary interest that i have in bitcoin is that if you think about cryptocurrencies from a uh, perspective of how uh, protocols are built it resonates the idea resonates a lot with me that what you should focus on is building the soundest most robust technological foundation and then if you want special functionality uh, such as uh, expressiveness or privacy or you know whatever you can come to think of those th- that type of functionality should be applied to the protocol stack in upper layers. So Bitcoin has always appealed to me as the protocol that is focused primarily on security, decentralization, and openness. And those three attributes are the the, 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 the attributes that I consider are uh, instrumental to building a sound foundation. And everything that we sort of want to build all the other attributes that we want in a cryptocurrency, we can think of ways to introduce those uh, that functionality in the upper layers. The one thing that I would uh, perhaps disagree a little bit with that theory is on the privacy side. It's uh, we've we've discovered that building not building in privacy at the base layer makes uh, if if you if you create any friction between. Uh, for the user to to if the if the if the, de- if the default is not private, then you're not gonna have uh, as many users using privacy, and you kind of need everybody to use the privacy features in order for people who are using the privacy features not to stick out. So I think this is the reason that I'm interested in Bitcoin. I think it's the one that has the strongest focus on the core fundamentals and principles that make cryptocurrencies okay. valuable. Okay, I, I do want to challenge that point. I mean, it seems, I know, you know, people have talked about that, you know, you could build all kinds of stuff on top of Bitcoin. And, you know, at some point people did, right? You had things like counterparty and master coin and colored coins and stuff like that. But, you know, for the, for the most part, all of that stuff has failed. And, you know, today, basically, 
uh, hardly anybody build tries to build you know applications on top of Bitcoin that you know aren't related to sending money around or you know some some things around the core the core focus of Bitcoin. Is, do you think that's going to change in the future, or, or if not, why is that why is that not happening today? I think it uh, is already changing, and the way that I think of it is so. I think that uh, so the, the 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 only really interesting thing that I found find outside of of Bitcoin and perhaps privacy coins is the DeFi space, the DeFi ecosystem, the expressive layers. But the way that I see it is that if you can tokenize Bitcoin on Ethereum or perhaps in Cosmos, then the Bitcoin token becomes it, it does acquire those properties of these other systems. So the, 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 the Ethereum can essentially act as a sidechain to Bitcoin. Cosmos can act, uh, perhaps you know a lot more about that, but it, it, in, my, in my understanding, it, it can act as a DeFi layer to Bitcoin. So I believe that through tokenization of Bitcoins into these other protocols, Bitcoin can acquire the, the functionalities that, that, that these other protocols have as, as well. Yeah, no, I, that I would agree with. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that's something that we are going to increasingly see, of course, that is absolutely a core focus of Cosmos to make that possible. The, it's not easy to do that with Bitcoin exactly because there's this kind of lack of smart contracts on the Bitcoin side. So I think it would be actually much easier to connect different proof of stake chains or like proof of stake chains and Ethereum a little bit harder, but still possible. And then to go to Bitcoin is, is even harder to do it in a kind of decentralized, trustless way. But still, it's going to happen. I think there's so many people working on this. Yeah, but then you you still have these other chains that, you know, are basically kind of independent, right? And their security is then not guaranteed by the Bitcoin blockchain. Sure, yeah. So I, I focus on... the. Um... I think that Bitcoin has another thing to it. If you look apart from the technology, Bitcoin is winning this public perception of something that can be perceived as a digital gold or a, a collectible. And that thing, because the properties are very predictable in Bitcoin, I think that if, if we can just get it into the public mindset that Bitcoin is an asset that you can have in your portfolio, like a digital gold, I think that the specific technicalities of how Bitcoin can be transferred into uh, expressive layers through some pegging mechanisms, and there's different ways that you can design these pegs. I mean, li the liquid sidechain, that's one example of how, how a peg can be designed. But if you look at, for, uh, for instance, drive chains, uh, that's a minor operated uh, uh, peg that you can also design. So I think that there are ways that you can uh, put Bitcoin into these other protocols by tokenizing it. But the, 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 what's mainly important is that the public, that there's a public trust in that the attributes uh, that Bitcoin has as an e economic object, that the supply is, is uh, that, that, that the monetary uh, structure around it, the, the monetary supply schedule and all those things are actually predictable and that we can believe them. And Bitcoin has a 10 year track record, which is why I believe that Bitcoin could be the asset that wins this this use case. Yeah, no, I, I totally, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think Bitcoin is, is certainly has a massive advantage there in terms of your narrative perception, mind share. And I think that is going to continue in the foreseeable future. Um, Let's talk a little bit about proof of stake. I've seen you've written about proof of stake a bunch of times uh, on Twitter. There's been some interesting discussions, and I think you've had some evolution in your view on proof of stake. Do you want to walk us through like how you looked at proof of stake when you started writing, and what has kind of happened in the past few months? Uh, yeah, sure. And I, I'm super happy to 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 jump into this topic specifically with you because I think you might have some 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 good insights here but so so basically my perspective on the proof of stake versus proof of work discussion has mostly well perhaps not mostly but but one of the things that's been of a very very high interest is the impact on society that the economics of these protocols have so the perception in the in in, in in the world perhaps now about proof of work it has always been that proof of work is is very wasteful 
And a few years ago, there was a blog post and, uh, by uh, Paul Stork, who's an economist, who made the argument very eloquently that if there is a block reward in the system, and there's a way that you can improve your odds of getting that block reward, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's burning electricity or if it's locking up capital, you will always be uh, spending the same amount of resources uh, in order to earn the block reward. So if the block reward is, let's say, $1,000 every month, the, the miners or the stakers will always spend roughly $999 in order to earn that block reward. And I think that uh, most people in the Bitcoin space, they that when they think about proof of work and they think about proof of stake, they think about this blog post and they think that, you know, nothing is, and the title of the post is nothing is cheaper than proof of work. And therefore we don't have to bother with uh, proof of stake. And uh, that was the way that I was thinking about it because I know that uh, apart from uh, apart from the economics, uh, proof of stake has more complex uh, and uh, more more complex uh, technical characteristics. For example, the the weak weak subjectivity problem. There's all these other sort of attributes that we get with proof of work by burning an external resource that is a lot more difficult to reason about when the uh, a resource that is securing the the system is is internal to the protocols it, uh, itself. Anyway, so th so this is th this 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 was my perspective on the debate for a long time, and because of that, I didn't spend more uh, time thinking about the the economic side of things until uh, a, a recent Twitter debate that I had with um, a number of people in the industry, and I'm so happy that we could get. Um, uh, a, a number of really, really smart people that has done a lot of thinking on this specific topic that came into that thread and started to question my uh, reasoning. And if I, I, I can jump into some of the counter arguments to that theory that I encountered in that thread that has been instrumental in shaping my thinking since then. And I would say that these days, Nowadays, my thinking around the proof of work proof of, uh, versus proof of stake topic is that it's a lot more. There's a lot more depth to that question than the single uh, blog post by Paul Stork. So there's a lot more uh, to explore here. Yeah, let's let's go into let's go into the counter or the, or the things you encounter that ended up changing your thinking. Yeah, right. So one of the first uh, comments to that thread was from David Schwartz, who's the uh, CTO of uh, Ripple, I believe. And his comment was that proof of stake is at the end of the day, more efficient than proof of work. And the way that he made this argument is that in a, in a, in a, in a, in order to double spend, in a proof of stake system, the punishment that you will suffer from trying to, from, from when the validators are double signing uh, blocks uh, that are conflicting each other in order to, to create a double spend attack, the, the, the economic punishments for doing that are massive. So even though that perhaps, you know, the cost, the, the, the cost of locking up your liquidity uh, is just you know nine hundred ninety nine dollars per per block. The punishment is not nine hundred ninety nine dollars. The punishments can be uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, the punishments for for double spending in proof of work uh, are also very large. Uh, but it's, it's it's much more difficult to reason about. For instance, you can think about uh, in in proof of work, if there is a miner that happens to accumulate fifty one percent of the hash rate. And that miner now wants to reorganize the chain. Some people can argue, well, this miner probably has a lot of capital, you know, invested into his mining equipment. But you can also also argue that, you know, what if this miner has recovered those costs by mining profitably for a while? Then it's not such a huge loss because he's already made back the money that he made on that upfront uh, investment. Then, of course, you know, he has to mine some blocks and he has to reorganize the chain, but it doesn't even have to be his own blocks that he's reorganizing. He could reorganize uh, some other miners blocks. Uh, and if the blocks make it into the chain, then that miner will, you know, earn the, the block rewards for those blocks that he produced. So 
in in a proof of stake system when you, when when you are double spending you know for sure that once this attack gets detected the protocol will slash you know hundreds of millions of dollars worth of worth of stake whereas in proof of work you don't really have those same guarantees exactly what the economic punishment is going to be so the 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 way that he uh, that uh, jo- uh, david describes this is that there's an asymmetry to the security of proof of stake versus proof of work, where in the proof of stake protocol, the punishments can be uh, much higher. And it also makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it, it, it also makes sense if you think about it that, you know, if everyone will be spending some resource uh, to to maximize their odds to to earn the block reward in proof of work, you're always burning in you're always burning a resource, whereas in proof of stake, you're just uh, l- locking that resource down, which is ob- obviously much cheaper to do to the individual, which means that they will lock up more of the resource, uh, resource versus the guy that's actually you know burning the resource. Uh, so that's also how you can come to an intuitive uh, conclusion that what's going to be uh, the, the the amount of assets that's going to be at stake when you when you do something in proof of stake is larger because it's cheaper to the individual to to do that specific action. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe just sort of what one another way of kind of phrasing is a point you made here is, if you look at let's let's assume there's a network that's worth a billion dollars, you know, if if you look at uh, a chain like Cosmos, then for double spending you would need to have basically you know two thirds doing something malicious, so you, you could have like a slashing in the order of you know hundreds of millions, so let's say at least 33% would get slashed, right? Because they would have to sign on, on two chains at the same time. Um, if you look at a, a similar network, if it's a proof of work network, well, proof of work network might have, you know, 5% inflation a year or something. So the amount of money that goes into buying mining equipment and building mining farms as a percentage of the assets at stake it's like much, much lower, right? So in, in Bitcoin, you know, I don't know, is it $5 billion or something, or maybe 10 at most? So as a percentage, right, it is much cheaper to go and buy like 51% there. And then of course, the, the other thing is like, even if you do that, and then you attack the chain, you know, in, in the proof of stake context, you would actually lose those assets that you used to attack with. But in the proof of work context, you still have your mining equipment. Uh, you, do, you don't lose that. Now, you know, maybe you wreck Bitcoin and your mining equipment is now somewhat worthless. But the nice thing, the nice thing of proof of stake is, you know, if you do that in proof of stake, it's possible to just punish you personally. Like the other people staking won't be punished by this, right? Because they can hard fork and you're out of the system. But in proof of work, well, if you wreck Bitcoin, then it's not just your ASICs that have become worthless, but everybody else is ASICs too. So I think there's also that characteristic that it's, if something really happened where you had now, I don't know, China, North Korea, some someone has maybe a majority of the hashing power in Bitcoin and used it to attack Bitcoin, it would be very difficult to recover from this. And in proof of stake, I think it's it's much easier to recover from those issues. Yeah, so I think that we agree with each other that there's an asymmetry here that uh, proof of stake can get more security for the same cost. At least if we if we talk about it from a purely economic, uh, if we're purely talking about economic security, and that in turn comes with some very very interesting second order effects. So if if you if you get more security for the same cost, that means that you can decrease in a proof of stake system how much is being paid out in the block reward and still have the same security as a as a proof of work chain right yeah absolutely right i mean if you see the the ethereum plans right they go very much down with what they're paying out or what they're planning to t- pay out when they switch to eth 2.0 and, and that's perfectly reasonable i i expect that the ethereum chain will still be perfect uh, as safe or more safe even than today with the proof of work. Yeah, so uh, Paul Stork actually jumped into this and I'm so glad that he did because I really, really wanted to see what Paul's 
counter arguments is to this uh, to these to these uh, counterpoints and what he said was that well you can't really if we assume that uh, in one point in time uh, all the block su- block subsidies will be gone and blockchains will operate purely on transaction fees then it doesn't really matter if it's a proof of work system or a proof of stake system because the transaction fees will be the same and i think that he's also assuming that transactions fees will be sufficient in the proof of work system so even that you have this asymmetry between proof of stake and proof of work that you get more security the proof of stake the proof of work system will still be secure uh, so it, so the so the only thing that's happening on the proof of stake chain is that people are locking up these huge piles of cash but they're over securing the the, the protocol and I, I have a counter counter counterpoint to to what what Paul said because I've been thinking about this counter argument uh, for a while and I think that you know probably the assumption that he makes uh, that you know transaction fees will always be sufficient to secure the chain I mean that is a point of controversy within the Bitcoin ecosystem transaction fees vary from time to time uh, there could be you know uh, dips when there's lower uh, fewer transaction fees because there's not enough demand for uh, block space in the network so it, I think it's a bit naive to say that you know having this larger economic security for lower cost is never going to be relevant I think you know there's going to be plenty of, of, of times when it becomes relevant and if we if, if we really really get uh, put on our devil's advocate uh, hats here I mean you could imagine a situation where the proof of work protocol cannot you know sustain itself and be secure without a small uh, supply inflation a uh, constant supply inflation but a proof of stake uh, a proof of stake system uh, manages to keep itself afloat just with the transaction fees alone because it gets more security out of those uh, transaction fees and this in turn means that you the if you if you're uh, worried about things like high stock to flow and bitcoin has this uh, amazing property that is the most scarce asset if if a proof of work system is dependent on a little bit of inflation because it doesn't get enough security out of that of the, out of those transaction fees and you have a proof of stake protocol that manages to survive on you know smaller transaction fees then the proof of stake protocol will be the one that reaches you know the highest stock to flow before because it's the first one that will be able to turn off the the block wars uh, com- completely so I, I think that that highlights some of the not so undramatic consequences that comes with this asymmetry yeah and and let me just sort of add another point on this you know the other thing is let's say there's a block reward now of five percent in bitcoin well those five percent go to like you know miners and mining hardware and electricity so as a bitcoin holder that's just dilution to me and i own a smaller percentage of bitcoin a year f- later but in a proof of stake system you know if there's a five percent even if they if they keep a five percent inflation then i can stake my coins and you know i will receive of those five percent you know let's say validators keep like ten percent of it or something like that right so i ke- i receive maybe four and a half percent of those five percent as some kind of interest and so my you know my decrease in relative ownership is much, much smaller than what you'd see in a proof of, st- a proof of work system. Right. So another very interesting counter argument that came into this thread was from Dan Robinson. And his argument um, was, so, so the Paul Stork's idea is that both proof of work and proof of stake have costs to the individual uh, it costs you money to lock up your stake it costs you money to burn electricity but he also argues that the costs to society are comparable because um, if you uh, if you're burning e- energy that's of course you know costly to society but if you have investment if you have capital that could have been used you know going to investments, and you are locking that capital up in a proof of stake system, then that's also going to be costly to the, to the, uh, to society because that's that's money that's now taken out of the economy that's ta- been taken out of uh, out of circulation. So Dan's counter argument to this point, which is uh, very interesting, I think, is that uh, wealth in our world you know, can never be measured 
in in money i mean the 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 wealth that the, that we have in the world is always expressed in the number of goods and services that's at at disposal for the, the for the population and uh, you cannot simply by taking out uh, money out of a system decrease the number of goods and services i mean the goods and services the how many you know gallons of oil or how many trees or how 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 many gallons of milk there are stays the same so the only thing that happens when somebody is staking their capital it means that there will now be more uh, resources that other per- uh, people can can purchase so he describes this as okay so if one i mean this the ex- in the exact same way that uh, a government cannot make uh, uh, its country richer by printing money. The only thing that is happening is that you're diluting the wealth of everybody else. If one person is staking their capital, it means that that money is now taken out of uh, circulation and it makes everybody else a little bit richer because that person who had that capital can no longer you know, buy assets with it, which means that there's more uh, goods and services to go around uh, for everybody else. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I I guess I think about it in a maybe slightly different way. So if you look at you know look look at something like Cosmos, which I think has maybe eight hundred million dollars, you know, market cap. But what does market cap mean? It doesn't mean people have taken you know eight hundred million dollars worth of uh, you know fiat money and they have locked it up in this place and you know now it's not available to the rest anymore. No, it means that, you know, there's expectations about, you know, kind of the future potential, you know, utility of this protocol and, and the value of, you know, transaction fees that could be accrued to uh, to this Atom token and maybe some other use cases that come about. And so people marginally are willing to pay a price per Atom that, you know, kind of values all of them at 800 million. So it's strange to me to say, oh, this capital now is not available elsewhere anymore because it never existed elsewhere but what do you th- what do you think about the argument that let's say that an investor an, an investor has a billion dollars and he can choose to deploy it to fund various types of businesses but instead he takes that capital and he goes and he becomes a staker in a proof of stake system and that billions of dollars that he had is now forever locked up let's say he you know continues staking forever do you think that there's any cost to society that this this uh person chooses to do something else uh with his capital instead of you know putting it to productive use in the economy but but if if this person has a billion dollars and they want to like you know go stake it right they can't stake the billion dollars they can only stake staking assets so what are they going to do they're going to go on the market and potentially buy a billion dollars worth of staking assets but then i mean somebody else has now received those billion dollars in assets and they've given up the staking assets so presumably i mean if they whatever you know they could do in the economy then those new people who are now the owners of this billion dollars could do so it's not like the billion dollars have disappeared somehow from yeah. the you know non-staking world yeah so paul's counter argument to what dan says is that I mean, while it's true to some extent that money is like a gla- glass of water and, and it doesn't matter like how you pour it, it's always going to balance out in the end somehow. But there is something more to that. And and the, the point here is that, so how Paul thinks about this is that it's true that there isn't value in a unit of money in itself, but there is tremendous value in the distribution of money. So in in a, in a, in a functioning economy, uh, in a market, uh, ideally what you'll have is these pockets of money that, that uh, build up where you'll have a lot of uh, uh, capital placed into the right individual hand, in the individual hands that can uh, create concentrated capital injections into various types of businesses. So it's not, it, uh, the point is that uh, let's say that you can have a, a one um, uh, entity that has a billion dollars versus uh, having you know a, ran, a, 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 a hundreds of thousands of, of uh, you know average joes that has one dollar bill extra in their pocket. The the usefulness to society that th- this capital is concentrated. Is, uh, is 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 larger than 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 the nominal value of the assets in aggregate uh, themselves, and I 
I think I understand Paul's argument because what he's essentially saying is that is in terms of entropy and how it works in thermodynamics. So you can think of it um, in, in, in thermodynamics when you have order in a system, you have more energy. Uh, so that's low entropy means higher order, more order, and more energy. Whereas in a high entropy system, that means that you have disorder and you have low energy. And I think that you can apply a similar logic to economics. So these concentrations of capital that you see in an economy, that is expression of, of order in the system. And it means that you have a higher economic potential. And if you just, I mean, if, you, if we would eliminate uh, money from, from society and just give everybody $100, then the whole economy would start over and it would take a long time to get to the specific order that we have now that sort of is the, um, the, the, the structure that creates the economic potential we have in the system. So that's, a, that's, that's, that's just a theory that I have that I think uh, that, that's one way to try to understand what, what Paul is saying. I don't know if that makes any sense at all to you. Yeah, it's... It certainly makes sense to me that, you know, sort of where the money is, it has effects, you know, different effects on society. You know, if, if we had your example before, let's say there's one entity who's very rich versus, you know, lots and lots of people that have somewhat more money. I mean, I would say probably for the most part, I would expect that it would be better for society in an economy, you know, in the latter case, because they will tend to like spend it more on consumption or maybe the, the, the utility for them. Uh, it's much higher for the money than you know the marginal utility for like some some very rich person. Uh, you know, of course, there is always questions of like how you would do that as a social policy, and if that's sensible, you know, and that's kind of a different topic. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I I guess I would agree that kind of you know distribution and where money is concentrated matters. Now, I'm not sure what that really means in the case in the proof of stake example or in the example before we had okay somebody comes in and invests a billion in proof of stake assets has that now positively changed that concentration and distribution of money or negatively i have no idea uh, i th i think there's uh one way that we can attack paul's argument that's 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 a lot more effective and i think like even if we assume that Paul's right and uh, you know the distribution of assets does matter in the system and you know taking one billion out of one guy's hand isn't equivalent to just redistributing it into you know smaller denominations out of hundreds of thousands of people, I think that if we think about the game theoretical side of things and if we think about okay so who will it be that will be staking and we and we, we get a little bit uh, more specific, so in 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 mining in proof of work. I don't know if you've been following the the uh, you probably have the conversations recently, which is that uh, in a mining system, uh, mining will tend towards using the cheapest uh, energy sources available on the planet, and it turns out that uh, the cheapest energy source on the planet are the types of energy sources that are uh, trapped. So that can be. You know, natural gas, solar, wind, or you know, um, excessive hydropower. Uh, uh, it's it's um, energy sources that are inaccessible, that cannot be used for anything else. But you can get mining equipment there, and you can ex start extracting uh, those trapped uh, energy sources. So that's the the green energy argument for mining. And I'm not I I'm, I'm not uh, sure. You know how. Um, you know, how prevalent th this is. I have seen indications that the, these type of trapped energy sources are picking up. But I, in a, in a more general sense, I think it makes sense. I mean, the, the cheapest energy is the type of energy that you don't have any other uh, use for, uh, right? Yeah, um, yeah. so th I would say this is probably the uh, one of the biggest things that has changed my mind about uh, Bitcoin mining is I used to uh, be very, very worried about it and about the environmental impact. And I have read some of these, you know, studies looking at the energy distribution of the Bitcoin network. And uh, it does seem like it from from what I've read and the sort of studies that have been done that that's actually much better than, you know, I would have expected. And there is there is a lot of this, yeah, excessive hydropower or I guess in the US now where they use this excessive natural gas. 
uh, and and so yeah, that's that's definitely, you know, a, a positive or or something that probably mitigates a lot the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the 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 interesting thing that I've realized while thinking about this problem is that okay, so we have green mining that use utilizes sort of trapped, uh, 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 trapped energy, but I think that you can apply the exact same principle to staking and so here's here's how i think that okay so what is the cheapest uh, possible capital source for staking in ethereum and i think it's pretty obvious i mean the people who are long ethereum and want to be long ethereum for the next five to ten years um, i mean that's they will have virtually zero economic cost when they are staking it doesn't make any difference whatsoever to society if a person that's going to be holding uh, onto their ethereum for 10 years if he also stakes during that time period so you can sort of think about this like okay so we have trapped energy in in the in the proof of work world but we also have trapped capital uh, in in the uh, staking world and the the interesting thing is that um the same way that mining the the, the cheapest the, the person who is che- mining with the cheapest energy source will start to outcompete the miners who aren't using the cheapest energy source it's the same way in staking right i don't know if it works this way in cosmos but in in, in ethereum the more people who are staking the lower the yields are so if you have a 1 million ether that's staked then the yields could be something like 18% but if you have 100 million then that's going to have uh, drop down to something more like 1.8 uh, percent percent so if it's uh, the, the 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 people who will be, um, ex- be the people who will be accepting the cheapest yields are the people who have already decided that i am long ethereum no matter what i'm going to hold this asset so they basically have no economic cost to them for and i'm talking about economic like not including of course the the costs of, of of running a node but just you know the cost of locking up that that capital so i would argue you know, that you can leverage these people that have um, a, a very uh, long term uh, holding strategy for ethereum as the capital source for uh, staking uh, in ethereum and it doesn't that doesn't you know have these these that th- doesn't cost them anything and it certainly doesn't cost society anything yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And I, I think the other, I guess maybe we can go there. The other topic is, or, or the other possibility where, you know, we have been working on that problem uh, as course one and, and others have been working on it too. You know, if you think of like, what is one of the core innovations of the blockchain and and one of the core trends that's going on, I think it's basically to say, you know, we've had some some asset that was somewhat illiquid, you know, hard to deal with, uh, and we tokenize it, and then we sort of unleash all of these additional potential. And so in proof of stake, what you have is generally you say like, okay, you're kind of locking up this capital and it becomes this illiquid asset that you can't transfer, you can't use as collateral for other things. But just in the same way as many projects in the blockchain world have token or tokenizing other kinds of assets, the same is going to happen with staking assets. So that, you know, I think, for example, it will absolutely be possible in the not too far future to say, okay, I'm going to stake my atoms, but I can also use like a tokenized version of this and I can either go trade it or maybe I can use it as, you know, collateral to take out a loan. And, and so I think this multiple uses of the same collateral is going to happen with staking assets. And I think that's also going to, you know, kind of reduce this idea of, um, you know, collateral or capital being locked up. And, 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 you know, there are the early examples of that in Ethereum. You have uh, compound ETH, right, where you can basically put Ether into compound and then it's being lent out and you earn some interest on that and you can get a token back, right? So now I have this basically interest bearing Ethereum token that is, you know, on the one hand, the Ether is in compound doing work, providing liquidity, earning some interest. And on the other hand, I still have a tokenized asset that, you know, I could do lots of different things with, including, you know, I'm sure in, in the not too far future, probably 
you'd be able to put it in a CDP in Maker and get out some uh, loan against that, for example. And so I think all of that stuff is going to come for proof of stake assets as well. And uh, we are going to see this, you know, hyper efficient and hyper liquid and fluid um, crypto assets. And that can be uh, used for many different things simultaneously. Yeah. So, so I have to, um, I uh, am more skeptical towards this uh, staking derivatives idea. And, and, and the reason for that is that, okay, so let's go to your example. Um, we imagine a world where you can both stake your Ethereum and you can also uh, loan it out on Compound at the same time, right? But in my in my head, if you if you if you if you can do this with the same asset at the same time, that means that you will be creating a more competitive market both for staking and for loaning out capital on Compound at the same time, which means that the yields will be decreasing so you'll have more assets that are being committed to these protocols but you'll also get lower and lower yields for doing that so i'm not necessarily um, confident that it's the super fluidity is uh, such a good thing because it feels like you're you're only i mean if, if you if we think about it now you have one pool of people that are uh, loaning out their assets on on, on uh, compound and you have one pool of uh, pool of people that are uh, committing their their assets into st staking if these pools now you can do the same thing with the the, the, the you can do the b both things at the same time with one asset it means that you'll have you know twice as much or the the the, the two pools will be uh, doing both things at the same time it will increase the supply on uh, you know the, it will increase the size of the staking pool and it will increase the size of the loaned out capital in in compound and that should decrease the yields accordingly. Uh, at the same time, you have now, you know, increased risks in the system because you're hypothecating the same asset multiple times, which means that uh, in compound, not only is there now a risk that you know something happens in the in, in, in the compound protocol, but you can those assets can also get slashed, right? Because they're also tied into a, a specific staker in the in the staking protocol. So I think that you're you're layering risks on top of each other and you're decreasing yields and I'm not 100% sure like what what the benefit is. Yeah. I, I think that's uh, I I think it's absolutely true, right? That you know, you would see uh, more assets being staked and I think it would be possible for protocols to, you know, decrease staking rewards as a consequence. And uh, yeah, I think it's true that more assets would be available to lend, so you'd have more supply there, right? So you have more supply uh, of those assets, and and I agree. I think it would decrease yields. I, I'm not sure why. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, it, it, yeah, it's also true that you are layering risks in some way, but that's okay. I think you know, like if you if you look at, for example, um, Cosmos today, right? If you're staking atoms then sort of the, actually the only capital at risk is 5%. At right? the most you could lose of your, you, you're staking a million dollars worth of atoms, you at most could lose $50,000. You know, if your validator, you know, let's say you only delegate to one validator and they double sign. Um, so in a way, there's already a lot of capital that's kind of locked up, but not at risk. So if you can, uh, you know, if you can kind of like reuse that capital, I, I think it's not, a bad thing and I, I think you know what blockchain does give us is you will have kind of transparent provenance of you know where is what risk and people should be able to price it and and with regards to why to do it or, or yeah please respond to that if you like yeah so i mean my the 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 the, the reason that i'm bringing it up is that like let's assume that there's uh, some truth to what paul stork said that um the more capital that's being locked up into into staking then uh, you know that's capital that's being taken out i mean it's 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 now becoming inaccessible to the market uh, and then you know the counter argument that uh, um, that i've seen now from people from the cosmos world is saying that well we have staking derivatives so with staking derivatives you you yes we're locking up the capital but you can still use it for other things but i think that the effect of you know uh, making that locked uh, up liquidity not locked up anymore simply means that it will be 
cheaper for people to to stake and and more people will be staking so while it's true that it i mean i don't think that there's uh, it feels like a zero-sum game here in in, in, a, in a in a sense do you get what i'm saying yeah i mean i mean i, I can tell you sort of the one of the key reasons why we think it's important why we are working on it um and that's because if you don't have that in our view, it will lead to an accumulation of staking assets with centralized exchanges. And, you know, let's look at the Ethereum example uh, for this. So in Ethereum, they plan to have a, or, or, or Polkadot, I'm actually not totally sure about what ex at the moment the idea is with Ethereum. But in, in Polkadot, like let's say you, you're going to stake dots, you're going to have a four month on bonding period. So you have it, you like, let's say you invested in dots, and, you know, maybe the, it's going to be a huge bull market and you would like to liquidate some of your dots. Well, you're going to have to unbond, wait four months during which you don't earn staking rewards. Only then can you sell. Maybe the bull market's already over, right? So there's a high cost uh, from that perspective. But if, you, if you're going to put your coins with Binance, you know, Binance is going to stake them for you. They will just pay interest, uh, you know, interest on your kind of exchange holdings. And you will be able to, like, sell them at any time, you know, because... It's just an entry in the Binance, um, you know, Binance database, right? So they don't have to do any unbonding when you sell any tokens. And similarly, they will be able to allow you to use it for like margin uh, on other things. And, you know, they could potentially allow you to lend it out and do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, so, so in our view, if you don't allow all of those things to happen in a decentralized way, you will end up seeing proof of stakes assets highly concentrated on exchanges and be already seeing many exchanges launching these staking products from you know Kraken to Poloniex to uh, Binance and to others. And that's an existential threat for proof of stake networks. Because you know, let's let's say you have like 30% of the Bitcoins that are held on centralized exchanges. I mean it's maybe not desirable, but it's not like an existential threat for Bitcoin. But in proof of stake assets, you know, if the, the private keys associated with the staking assets, they also control the consensus process, often they control on-chain governance. So if, if those, for the most part, end up accumulating with centralized exchanges, you know, this is very bad for proof of stake. And I think this absolutely needs to be prevented. And in our view, the way to do that is basically to make staking assets liquid so that you can make all kinds of interesting DeFi applications and you now have this kind of composability that you have on Ethereum today in this open decentralized way that will then hopefully also give people ways to do things and use those assets that you know centralized exchange can't easily replicate. And you know our, our hope is that this will lead to people self-custodying their assets more uh, keeping, you know, give decentralized exchanges a way to compete with centralized exchanges. And I think it would be very key for proof of stake to, you know, to survive. And that's kind of, you know, independent of, you know, the particular economics and, you know, what kind of interest rates result. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. And, and I'm just thinking about from, from our fund perspective, I mean, we, we are, uh, let's say we hold some uh, Ethereum or another proof of stake asset. Uh, uh, an obvious, you know, um, interesting thing for a fund is to uh, start staking those um, those assets. But from a fund perspective, um, you are sort of forced into using third parties anyway for for your custody of the assets that you hold. I mean, the fund isn't allowed to hold uh, funds on its own in many cases. So um, in a, in a in a in a in a and that's certainly one of the things that worry me about pr uh, proof of stake that there's going to be massive swaths of of capital that uh, centralize around centralized exchanges and the worrying thing is that um, you know the exchange gets massive amounts of capital and can and, and can start messing with the consensus process uh, but there's one thing that i'm i'm curious about um, it's whether so you have delegation vouchers in cosmos and I want to understand if those are really identical to staking derivatives in Ethereum, because I think that they might be a little bit different. Because in 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 uh, 
in uh, Cosmos, you're always uh, as a as a as a non um, as a non validator, you're always delegating your 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 uh, atoms to to uh, to a validator like Chorus One, right? But in uh, in Ethereum, I'm not sure that it's the exact same risk because you you're describing it now that if you are uh, using these delegation vouchers, you don't have you, you have the slashing risk, but you don't have the custodial risk. I'm wondering if that's also possible with staking derivatives in Ethereum. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, delegation vouchers don't exist yet on Cosmos, right? So we, we built this in the hackathon originally. Uh, you know, we originally had the idea kind of with Sunny um, Argawal in, in the summer and, and we ended up building a prototype. And, you know, uh, I, I think next year, something like this will start to become possible in Cosmos. But like right now, it's not yet. Um, Ethereum, so I'm not like super up to date with Ethereum proof of stake, but you know, my understanding of how Ethereum proof of stake is going to work is that there's no delegation, you know? So in, in Cosmos, if you have some atoms that you can basically make a transaction, say, okay, I want to delegate with course one and you still retain most of the control of the atoms. It's just that you're at risk of, of slashing and you know, you kind of rewards are correlated with how well we do, but on Ethereum, I think the idea is that uh, there's no delegation. So if you would want to kind of have somebody stake on your behalf, you'd actually have to send them your ether. Uh, so I think it will be uh, more complicated and more difficult to create these kind of, um, you know, some sort of tokenized version of state ether. Yeah, I think it's uh, exactly the way that you said it. That's, you don't have the delegation. You, you can't really delegate in the same sense in Ethereum. What you can do is you can, of course, become a validator and you can stake with your Ethereum. And you can write a smart contract where um, uh, you get a token that uh, is backed by some of those assets that are being staked. But I don't think that you can get away from the sort of custodial relationship that you need to have with with uh, that person when you hold when you hold the token that is uh, uh, backed by somebody else's stake. There's always the chance I think that that person could run away with the whole bucket of of of, of Ethereum. I could be wrong about that, but that's how I think about it right now. Yeah, I think that's my understanding as well. So that's, you know, it, of course, it's intentional in some way from the Ethereum side, right? Because they, they want to have like lots of little, you know, people running the nodes. But there's also this side effect that, you know, it may lead to, you know, again, it may it may make it very attractive to do uh, staking on a centralized exchange because they already have custody of your assets anyway, right? So it's not a... It's not really, plus they tend to have some sort of regulatory, you know, framework that allows them to have custody and will probably allow them to do this. So it, it again, could make uh, exchange staking particularly attractive on Ethereum. Uh, but, you know, it's early to say, and, and I think all of this stuff are kind of in, in an early experimental stage and we'll have to see how, how this develops in the next year and two. Yeah, I, I can definitely see your concern. I think uh, Meher Roy put it, uh, very well when he said that the um, centralized entities they spawn into the game with rocket launchers whereas you as a if, if you are just a, uh, uh, a a validator i mean it's difficult for you to be able to provide these extra nice services to the people who are delegating the stake to i mean i think he has a point in saying that you know when you're at an, at an exchange you can get instant liquidity for your a staked capital, you can trade with them, you can load it out, you can do a bunch of things. To do that in a decentralized way, I think uh, it's going to be probably, and, and also making that product popular enough in order to get people to choose the decentralized path before the centralized one, sounds like it's going to be one of the most difficult and most important challenges for, for Cosmos. Yeah, no, not just Cosmos. I think this is a, a problem that's very general proof of stake, yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks so much, Eric, for joining me. I really enjoyed this uh, this conversation. It's great to hear your thoughts on proof of stake and how they've evolved. I really uh, kind of agree with basically pretty much everything you said. So I'm excited to see like where your thinking is going to evolve in the next, in the near future on that. Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I hope we speak again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Eric.
Thank you for listening to the Chorus One podcast. Visit chorus.one for more information about our work. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to stay tuned on new episodes airing every Monday.